So just a notification to everyone in the room, this meeting is this meeting is being recorded. Good afternoon. My name is Catherine Gardner, pronoun she, her, and I'm a resident of Vancouver. The English writer Cyril Conley wrote, hate is crystallized fear. Fear is dividend, fear is justified. We hate what we fear, and so where hate is, fear will be learned. Fear gets us book banned. Fear tries to hide knowledge that doesn't align with one's own views. A library is a place where all views coexist, the ones you're comfortable with and the ones you'd rather not see. Fear gets us smashed windows. Fear drives lies and misinformation masquerading as virtue. A library is a safe space. A library is a vault of truth. Except maybe in the fiction section. <laughs> fear has started crusades. It has tried and burnt innocence, stolen bodies and land, re educated children. Fear has pulled triggers, shouted slurs, ratted out neighbors, and turned on the gas. A library remembers what some would rather be. Fear abuses the wealth in the places that are for everyone. It worms its way in with the goal to claim and exclude. It rants about choice while taking options from others. A library is a neutral space for all who would choose to utilize it. It is perfectly all right to be afraid sometimes. Fear is normal and fear can be overcome. But when you let your fear manifest into hate, into words and actions that hurt people, then it becomes an issue. I'm once again asking the board of Fort Vancouver Regional Library to say no to hate fear has brought. I respectfully ask the board to genuinely consider bringing back a Drag Queen Story Hour for those families who would choose to attend. I encourage the board to stand by this library's mission to strengthen our communities through knowledge, experiences, and creativity. Thank you. Just one, sorry to interrupt. Just one moment. I was going to say, I don't think the mic was on. Uh, next speaker will be Christian Lange or Long. Uh, Christian. Hey, I had called in, but I, I don't know how to do this part exactly. I called like four hours ago to make sure I could talk. Um, I apologize. Who is this speaking? Justin Allen. Okay. Um, Justin, I will chat with you and uh, we can sort this out. Thank you. Well, I was hoping um, I'd see members of our Three Creeks Friends of the Library, but I was hoping at least Dennis Johnson would be here, um, but I'll start anyway. I've been a member in good standing with the Three Creeks Friends of the Library for over four years. I was hooked ever since my first meeting in this very room back in February of 2019, where we talked about a free library that is basically a small, freestanding little wooden frame shelf with a roof and window doors that house about 20 to 30 children's books. That night, we reviewed possible designs for the free library. I shared about while visiting my brother-in-law in Boise with my wife and daughter, we came across a small free library in the park across from his house. And my daughter put in a book we had brought with us that was well-read and exchanged it for an adorable little book about 10 ladybugs. I read that book to her dozens of times and we still have it. I've enjoyed helping Dennis Johnson with several book sales, going to the nearby storage unit and loading up a rental truck full of books, or more recently, loading up my truck full of books for a book sale. I've also enjoyed helping sort and set up the books on the tables by fiction, nonfiction, et cetera. By the way, Dennis started Three Creeks Friends of the Library and has been here long before this building opened to the public in Jan on January 2nd, 2002. Many here today did not know this about me, You've known me as a person concerned about safety and well-being of children, which I am, and I always will advocate for their best interests. As such, I ask that you do not have another drag queen story hour for children. People from a highly sexualized industry are not proper role models and teachers for children and are not what our library should be about. Thank you, guys. I know it's been a long day. I appreciate your service, especially those coming from many miles. So. Um, we honor you and just thank you. And yeah, God bless. Thanks. Our next speaker in line will be Bob Liggett. Uh, can, I, can I pop in there in that line then? Or I, I'm, I, I'm I, I very sorry. Hi, for the person who's um, speaking on the Zoom call, 
Um, we require a uh, written email um, request for public comment by 1 p.m. on the day of the meeting. I don't believe we received. Right. I, in previous times, people have done phone calls in, and I've seen the librarian person do it. Uh, I, I was calling multiple times with multiple members of your library staff around uh, noon earlier, and I was uh, I received an email from one of your librarians with the number to call in so that I could do this. This is my first time ever doing this so that I could uh, could participate as I have been. Okay. I uh, okay. would really Thank appreciate you. being able to just, you know, babble for 60 seconds even. If, if you could please wait and we will, if there is time at the end, we can have you make a public comment at that point. Can you remind me your name, please? I mean, I, I'm Justin Allen. I really, my phone's not gonna last that long. I'm in the middle of, like I pulled over from the side of the road on a trip that I have to go on to. And I, I really, my phone's not gonna last. I've spoken to the last previous two uh, library board meetings and I, I would have already finished my comments by now. I, okay, I assure thank, you. Thank you, Justin. Um, we are going to make an exception this time and allow you to speak. And um, if uh, at some point, well, I will, I will make note of your phone Just number. Cut, and cut I me will off call in two minutes. Sounds good. Thank yeah. you. You can go right now. Thank you. My name's Justin Allen. Uh, last Saturday, ahead of the kinds of lies that people have commonly heard about here, uh, people broke into and destroyed six windows, five or six windows at Heathen Brewing because an all ages drag thing that had been going on for 10 years, all of a sudden turned into pedophilia somehow without evidence. To any of the new members of the board, I've come to the last two meetings. Not a single person, not Gary Wilson, the leader of the Teal Shirts, has said a single fact about the sexualization of children. They claimed it, just like people claimed black people were raping white women in the 1930s. The same thing with Mexicans back in the 50s. And people are saying it now. Religious conservatives have lied about people raping others and sexualizing people for hundreds of years. And I really hope it'll stop. And uh, also on the 26th is gonna be a drag thing at Heathen. I hope nothing bad happens, but people have threatened to attack people again, all for freedom all because they think that lying about what people are doing and then coming to lie about it again uh, is just A-OK -okay, so long as you're defending kids from non-existent uh, sex crimes. So uh, I would highly hope that you bring back the drag queen stuff and because there's nothing wrong with it. Nothing's been wrong with it. And uh, Gary Wilson's been lying to you. Heck. He didn't even have the balls to give you a lie today. Just kind of describe that what he's doing is protecting kids, but all he's doing is, well, nothing like that. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you. All right, um, I, I will just reiterate who's in line at the moment. We have Jean, Randy, Dawn, Christian, and Bob, and they'll speak in that order. Thank you. My name is Jean Slagle. I am a um, strong supporter of libraries in general and kind of opposed to people calling me a liar because I'm not in favor of a drag queen being administered to my grandkids. So considering the source of anyone who's opposed to what that gentleman has to say is somehow a liar and other exclamations. The problem is being caused by the drag queen situation in the beginning. It's allowing someone kind of out of the mainstream to uh, subject mothers and children to this uh, unusual behavior, uh, dressed in a certain manner. And I'm more for the traditional library services 
Uh, and if someone has to speak to mothers and children, uh, a more traditional, let's go over the books and the specific thing, but uh, a story about your lifestyle and how, oh boy, wouldn't this be great if you could dress like me? And I mean, I haven't been to one, so I can't really critique it as well as I should. But uh, thanks for your ear on this. The next, next speaker to line up will be Phil. Hello, my name is Randy Schmidt. I'm standing before you today to object to drag queen story hour events targeting children where drag queens, males dressed in drag clothing and makeup imitate and exaggerate female gender, read stories to children with the intent of causing gender confusion. That's not my opinion. That's their stated fact on dragqueenstoryhour.com. That's where it comes from. There is no hatred, there's no bigotry behind the desire to protect children from persons and or events that have the specific goal of creating gender identity confusion. I would label the desire and goal of causing gender identity confusion as child abuse. Child defined in Washington state law as anyone under the age of 18. That's per the code RCW 9.68A.001. Remember, by law, children cannot consent to discussions and actions of sexual activity with adults by law. What I desire, what, how would I, why would I define this as abuse? It is readily acknowledged by all sides that youth that experience gender identity confusion have a much greater percentage of self-harm than the general population. It's not even debatable at this point. This is well documented by the American Pediatric Society and the AMA. I encourage our children, encouraging our children or youth to behave, identify in a manner that is known to cause self-harm rate is as high as 40% is evil. The same Washington state law as cited above quotes, and I quote it, the legislature finds that the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse of children constitutes a government objective of surpassing importance. The care of children is sacred trust and should not be abused. That is why all the safe library members are here. We believe that the care of children is a sacred trust. We desire to protect all the children in the community from ideologies and behavior that will cause them harm. So therefore, we ask the library board to care about our children in this community and move to protect them from the exploitation and harm by developing and implementing a policy that prohibits drag queen story hour events from all Southwest Washington libraries Time. in the future. Thank you. Our next speaker will be uh, in line will be Tiffany. Tiffany. Now, can you hear me? Oh. Now that we're several, my name is Don Sieber. Now that we're several years into this rush kids into transition model of gender treatment, gender doctors are making observations, and a number of European countries have stopped or severely limited transition treatments for minors. Last weekend, Dr. Susan Bradley, a pioneering gender doctor in Canada who opened a pediatric gender clinic in 1975, also expressed regret for using puberty blockers. We were wrong, she said. They're not as reversible as we always thought, and they have longer term effects on kids' growth and development, including making them sterile and quite a number of things affecting their bone growth. The top gender expert in Finland says it's important to accept children as they are, that even social transitioning is not neutral. Evidence from 12 studies show that when children are left to develop naturally, the vast majority, four out of five, come to terms with their bodies and learn to accept their sex. When they are socially transitioned, virtually none do. Some of these doctors are in the LGBT plus community themselves. Dr. Marcy Bowers, who performed the surgery on Jazz Jennings, and is also transgender set of surgery. But honestly, I can't sit here and tell you that they have better or even as good results. Bowers warned, if you've never had an orgasm pre-surgery and then your puberty is blocked, it's very difficult to achieve that afterwards. Dr. Bradley said you have to put yourself in the place of a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old who is thinking, this is my way to get normal. These kids are not faring well with the current affir affirmative approach. I don't know that any kids actually could, given the capacity of a 10 or 12 or even a 14 or 15 year old to understand the complexity of the decision that they are making on their long-term sexual and life function. It just doesn't make sense. Kids are inundated with transgender ideology and now 43% of those identifying as transgender or non-binary are between the ages of 13 and 24. One of their first encounters may be at the local library where men dress as women read stories, making them question their gender. Given what these doctors are saying and the provable harms that children are suffering, why in the world do we want to be any part of this? Time. 
Our next speaker in line will be Mike. Hi, my name's uh, Christian Manger. Uh I'm against the drag queen story hour because uh, it's a lot like putting someone wearing blackface in front of children. Uh, they are degrading and making fun of what is considered to be extremely painful disorder that people are struggling with and pain and it's causing a lot of pain and drag queens are making fun of them. They're dressing up and dancing around, being flamboyant and energetic. And that's just not appropriate. It's not appropriate for children and it's not appropriate for the community that they're making fun of and mocking. Um, and I agree with most of the comments that have been said so far that it's just, it's, it's not right for children. And as a board, it may be against the law, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do what's right just because the law says it's not. Our next speaker in line will be Katie. I'm Bob Lee from Washougal. And um, I am opposed to the Drag Queen's Story Hour. Um, not, not the Story Hour, just the Drag Queen being able to, to be leading it. Um, to me, either it's because of the way that they are dressed or the way that they're behaving or the, the stories that they're going over, that would be the only reason why it would be a significance uh, as opposed to anyone else giving this, having the Story Hour. Um, today, there are a number of buzzwords around, but they all come back to tolerance. And today, it is seen as tolerance as only a positive quality. It is also a negative quality in certain situations. If you are tolerate poor behavior by your kids, you're going to get more of it. If you're going to tolerate your kids playing in the middle of the streets, you, you provide a danger for them. So you have to look beyond the situation as it is right now. Where does this lead? What's next? Where does it go? The idea of trying to normalize their behavior has very tragic results. We have seen over the, the, over the last couple of years, the people in the medical profession have normalized this condition and have castrated boys and cut the breasts off of girls and, they, and, and to be seen as being normal. That is their standard of normal. And when you allow this normal behavior as it is right now, this is where it leads. Are we going to be a part of trying to normalize such behavior? Our next speaker in line will be Margo. Bill Cronovich. <clears throat> Thank you, library board members. We appreciate the conversation during last month's meeting about publishers determining a book is for older teens, ages 16 to 19, and our library classifying them as young adult, ages 12 to 17. As stated during the meeting, and every reasonable person can agree, it's obvious that some book content appropriate for 16, 19 year olds is not appropriate for a 12 year old. The excuse that it's up to the parents to police that what book, what books their children check out is passing the buck. The library as the owner of the book and allowing access to it to a child has the responsibility. Let's be responsible adults in what we allow children access to in our library. Here's an idea. How about a new classification? Older teens, you can keep the young adults as 12 to 17, but as content is getting more and more explicit, a new classification is warranted. They say change is good. Don't be afraid to adapt. Lastly, I want to thank Chair Morgan for attempting to instill fairness into our meeting minutes pertaining to descriptions of one's public comments. Many times in the past, people have commented on multiple facets of library services only, only to be recorded as against DQSH. Contrastingly, several months during COVID, a particular person's comment in favor of DQSH were given glowing reviews by the recorder of minutes with several paragraphs of what was talked about in detail while others, again, were just against DQSH. People are tired of reading fake news and seeing a certain narrative given all the hype. Your bias was showing? Thank you for noticing that creeping back in and calling it out. We just asked for fairness or, hey, how about equity? Equal outcomes for glowing reviews by our stenographers should be simple. Just keep the narrative fair. No one should control the press. Thank you very much. Our next speaker in line is Quill. Quill. 
Hello, my name is Tiffany Heine. <clears throat> Drag queens use clothing and makeup to imitate and often exaggerate feminine gender signifiers and gender roles. Drag took a foothold in America in 1880 by William Dorsey Swan. It was sexually motivated then and is sexually motivated today. The drag queen movement became politicized in 1969 and still is today. Drag queens are being used to sexualize their children as means of a political movement. Books of sexual explicitness are being read to children in public libraries and public schools, but if read in a home by an adult to a child, most definitely Child Protective Services would like to be made aware. Whether in a home or a library, both scenarios are repulsive. Our society's moral compass is barely hanging on, and if not put back into place, destruction is the only outcome. I stand up for the child who may very well have been sitting in that drag queen story hour who may have been sexually violated at home. But hearing the content of those books is saying to this child, your body is not being violated and to enjoy your body as someone else has already done so. Drag queen, be who you choose to be, but leave the children alone. Library representatives don't allow drag queen story hour. You don't allow vacation Bible school in this library. You don't allow priest Bible story hour in this library. So draw the line and make this right. Our next speaker in line is Eunice. Good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Mike Johnson. I live in Washougal. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. The third drag queen story hour held at the Vancouver Library, Community Library, where the drag queen performer Onalicious Mercury asked an eight-year-old boy what he wanted to be when he grew up, and the child answered, Spider-Man. The Onalicious said, or Princess Spider-Man, teaching the boy to question his gender. When is it ever the best in the best interest of a child to question their gender? No one will attempt to answer that question because they can't defend it. Recent studies have shown that children uh, and adults who se severely question their gender are 40 times more likely, not 40% more likely, but 40 times more likely to commit suicide or have suicidal thoughts than those who do not question their gender. Why would you want to lead an innocent three to eight year old child down this path, which is exactly what the Drag Queen Story Hour does? Also note that affirming the gender confused does not reduce the higher rate of suicide or suicidal thoughts as a person has previously mentioned at one of these meetings. Scientific case in point, Sweden, a gender affirming country for 50 years since the 1960s had in the cohort study, which is the longest and most comprehensive study done to date and was conducted over 30 years con concluding in 2011, which showed Sweden had the same higher rate of suicide or suicidal thoughts of the gender confused as that of those in the US at the same time. This proved that affirming the gender confused does not lower the, the, high, the higher rate of suicide, it's the ideology. Affirming the gender confused is not the answer and teaching healthy, innocent children ages three to six to question their gender is not in their best interests ever. Please do not have another drag queen story hour. Katie Emmerich, Vancouver. I'd like to talk a bit about conflicts of interest. Some of you need a refresher. I confess this is mostly for the benefit of the public who will thankfully will have access to this meeting via recording. I love the internet. That's where I saw this post by Chair Christy Morgan's husband, Doug, from February of 2022. I am very proud of my wife as she was appointed to the Fort Vancouver Library Board today. When God calls you to do something to make a difference, you do it. And then the comment made by one of the members of this local hate group that's been harassing board meetings and programs for years now, Christy has been an awesome addition and Olga just joined her and Penny to make three strong conservative board members. We will get a fourth next year. I hope you all know that you serve the entire FBRL region and not just your own interests and friends. I bring to your attention bullet points 11 and 13 of the Board of Trustees Ethics and Responsibilities, which you continue to disregard, frankly, along with several others, but I only have two minutes, so I'll stay on this one topic. Recognize that authority rests with the whole board assembled in public meetings and make no personal statements or promises on behalf of the board, nor take any private action which may compromise the board of directors. Avoid situations in which personal interests might be served 
or financial benefits gained at the expense of library users, colleagues, or the institution, and disqualify themselves immediately whenever the appearance of a conflict exists. The library is not your church. You serve the entire community while on this board, not your God, and queer programming is relevant to large sections of our community because we live among you. We are old and young. And all this hysteria about child abuse is irrelevant smokescreen. Either abide by the rules you agreed to follow and stop colluding to allow a fringe group control over a governing body or remove yourself from this board immediately. Could you uh, adjust something, please? Sure. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, I'm Margot Logan. I am an expert in child abuse. Uh, one of the first things I'd like to do is thank you for being here. And I went to the C, um, C Street Library on a Saturday, and I wanted to give that library a compliment. I went up to the children's section, which is on a, a separate floor, and I did, did see that it is configured that it would be unlikely for a pedophile just to be wandering around that could do something. And everybody there definitely was family uh, with a lot of children. So I want to thank you for that. And I want to <laughs> thank uh, Amelia for her comment last uh, month of um, banning Playboy. So I had to go back because my dad used to get Playboy and <laughs> had to go back and look. And I, I've made a, a testimony to that um, that I'll give out to you. So if you ban Playboy, then definitely you'd have to um, ban any books that are directed at children that show them children giving blowjobs to other children. So I think that's a really kind of a easy step forward when you're looking at books to put into the library. And I saw some good children's books there. And I, in fact, I read one, <laughs> a junior high book. And I'm um, going to make two suggestions, black rednecks and white liberals. If you could um, maybe look at that and put that in. It has a wide ranging history. I just read it. I thought I was pretty good at history, but there is a lot that I don't know. And this one is uh, healing heterosexuality, a uh, time, touch and talk. And when I read this, because I keep thinking about all the children who have been abused, and they're so easily abused when they are lacking affection and love. It just opens the door Hi. for anybody to uh, uh, abuse them. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Quill Onstead and my pronouns are they, them. I'm here to speak in support of Dry Queen Story Hour as a genderqueer member of the community. Last month, several speakers apologized that the queer community has been historically marginalized. Several of my past comments have touched upon the wave of growing legislation targeting the trans community across the country. There is nothing historical about our marginalization. As of the 2023 legislative session, it has finally come to Washington. HB 1214 would ban gender affirming care for minors. SB 5024 is modeled directly after Florida's Don't Say Gay bill. Life is hard enough for kids. What happens when a child knows they are different from their peers, but has no language to describe, to help them describe what that difference is? Dry Queen Story Hour and books about LGBTQ plus people give kids that language. Or as Mr. Rogers puts it, Anything that's human is mentionable, and anything that is mentionable can be more manageable. When we can talk about our feelings, they become less overwhelming, less upsetting, and less scary. The people we trust with that important talk can help us know that we are not alone. Dry Queen Story Hour is a vital program that teaches and represents, and that teaches kids about gender identity in an age-appropriate manner. Parents who do not approve of Drag Queen Story Hour do not have to bring their children to any Drag Queen Story Hour programs. Please allow Amelia Shelley and the staff of FERL Libraries to present Drag Queen Story Hour and other similar programs and have the district live up to the ideals espoused in FERL Libraries' equity statement. 
Thank you. Hello, my name is Eunice Ingerman, I'm a pronouns are she, her. When I was 11 or so, I asked my mother if girls could marry girls. Her answer came in a storm of forbidding vehemence with mentions of God, the Bible, and the exclusion from heaven, and conveyed a sense of strong disgust that for the next five decades, I never questioned it. That is, until my own daughter came out as LGBTQ. That brought me back to the same question, and this time my love for my child helped me overcome my inherited sense of disgust and my fear of eternal damnation to explore the topic. I was ready to hear a different point of view, read what science says about human sexuality, and learn how to support my daughter. I was so thankful for resources, books, articles, videos, etc., that helped me unlearn, learn, and grow. Unfortunately, I couldn't find many of the books that I needed in the public library. 30% of Washington's youth identify as LGBTQ. As more and more of them come out, a huge number of parents will need to do similar rethinking and learning that I did. Would you please make our public libraries a place to engage with multiple points of view on the subject so people can look into each, each and make informed choices to help their children thrive and keep our community safe, kind, and healthy. Next month, I plan to bring a list of resources to recommend to you. Thank you. That concludes our public comment. Do we still have time on the hour? Uh, yes, we do. Okay. Is there anyone who did not sign up that wishes to comment? We have some extra time today. Is there? Yeah, okay. Please just say your name when you get to the microphone. Thank you. Mary, also, is there anyone online who didn't yet get to comment? If I will I will ask. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Linda McPherson. And I wanted to say that I am opposed for the Drag Queen Story Hour. We have a responsibility to minors. Minors are not allowed in certain areas. We cannot go to rated R movies. And there's a reason for that. We must follow principles. And we are, I, I have been, um, I'm going to share, children are created in the image of God. And we have a right to protect the children. If we cannot, if a child cannot go to a drag queen, whatever show you guys have, I'm sure that's for adults. It's not for children. We need to protect our children. And if you guys want to do this, then you stay with adults, not minors. We have a right to protect the minors. Thank you. Oh, okay, go ahead. No. Just um, say your name before you start, please. Yes, my name is Brian Edwards. Uh, sorry, I didn't have time to prepare a speech. Um, I think the most important thing we want to, uh, I would like to point out to this committee is uh, the ability of choice. Uh, the country is built on choice and uh, providing resources to the community is an important, um, important thing for the community. So uh, that people have the choice. People have the choice to attend events or not attend events, to bring their children to events or not bring their children to events. But as a community, we need to be able to provide those options for people who would like to participate in those events. Uh, by providing choice, we're providing the resources for people to learn and grow. And I think that's what's most important about uh, a library and resources for that, for learning. And by providing people uh, opportunities to see different things in different cultures, which in this day and age is prevalent and important. Um, that, uh, that as a com as community, we provide for the entire community, not just a portion and uh, segregated uh, uh, portion. So yes, thank you. That's all I have to say. Questions? 
I, yeah, I don't, I didn't look at the hours, so we're good. Okay, please go ahead. Uh, say your name first. Uh, he just spoke of choice, and I don't understand how a child. I'm sorry to that. interrupt you. Could you just say your name and then. David Knight. Thank you. Yes. Uh, you just spoke of choice, and I don't see how a child should have this choice that you're talking about. This is the parent's choice. So I, it doesn't make any sense to me. This this is the parent's choice, not not the child's choice. So if the parents want to do that, then that's their child, I suppose. But this is a public library, and we're all paying taxes for this. Anyway, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Heather Harmon. I am a resident in Clark County, and I did not have anything prepared. I wanted to attend to observe the conversation to see how I can get involved in the conversation. And I appreciate your opportunity in letting me jump in and not being registered um, because I want to be a face. I want to be seen by those that are on the board as someone who does support dry clean reading hour. And um, when my my comment really boils down to an opportunity for people to make a choice to attend a variety of programming on the board. Obviously, not all families or children attend every event. They have an opportunity to select interests uh, and appropriateness. And it's not the three to eight year old that's taking public transportation or driving down to the library to do this. It is parent involvement or guardian involvement that is providing the opportunity. And I would only hope that it is up to the dynamic of the family or that structure, that guardian structure with the child to have the conversation about it. It is entirely a private decision, but it is important that the programming offered by the library is representative of our community. And I do feel that it is representative of our community to maintain that. and parents, guardians, and children have an opportunity to decide what they want to attend. And I appreciate the, your time in hearing me today. Thank you. Okay. All right, seeing no one else, I'm gonna- yeah, Oh, wait a second. Oh. oh, go ahead, yeah, okay. just say your name. Yeah, my name is New. Um, so this is a very complex, um, topic for children. Um, I think in early childhood and above, I feel like the kids are so indated with so much information that um, it allows them to go and have imaginations of things that may not be appropriate for them when they see it or they hear it because um, they're not at that psychosocial development to reason and to see things in a more mature manner. And I guess I'm saying this is because I am a mental health therapist and I work with early childhood and I pursued elementary ed and now I'm, I'm um, counseling adults. And I see this pattern. And I think that the more that we are um, opening the internet, more information is coming in, more values are being coming in, and they are just like overwhelmed with so much information and so much values that's input in them. That's why they're even more confused. And so if we can just keep it simple, um, I, what I hear in the public is that they there's books in the libraries that are, are images that are not appropriate for children's age. Where does that imagination lead them when they see a sexual act or just whatever it is? I mean, it could take them anywhere. And for youth who are still trying to find their identity and they see these images, where is that imagination taking them? So that is my concern. And I am I'm seeing the pattern. And I just like even at school as a teacher, just keep things simple. Keep it as, you know, they're valuable, they're precious. They're worthy in the site. Can we continue to reiterate the internal value of who they are and not so much of the external? That's it. Is there anyone else who wanted to speak? Nobody else? Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm closing public comment. We. 
Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I should have jumped in there. I definitely want everyone addressing us and not attacking one another for sure. Thank you. So we're now going to move on to our report um, section. And first up is the organizational report with Mary. Are you ready? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That might be too tall. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Mary Obler. I'm the deputy director for the organization, and I use she, her pronouns. We're going to do a, just a very brief organizational report. We're actually down a couple of our admin team members this weekend, um, so we'll keep this short. I do like to always have uh, patron comments front of, front of our uh, minds here. Um, we received this one at our Battleground Library. Last week, I went to the library to get away from the construction noise. It was so nice to sit in the by, to sit by the big fire and embroider in such a quiet environment. Thank you for my home away from home. So just wanted to share that with you. All right, and I'll pass it off to Lynn. Oh, Mary. Hi, I'm Lynn, um, and I'm the director for collection and technology. Uh, we have a new library payment kiosk. Um, we bought five of them and we've installed one here at the Three Creeks Library just this last week as our test site. It'll be here for a couple weeks before we roll out the rest just to work out the kinks. So this allows the patrons to come up and pay for a lost item, let's say, or buy some earbuds without the staff having to handle cash. The auditor requires every time a new person comes to the desk that they count the drawer and to say, yes, the right amount of money's here. And then the other person has to count, yep, I'm taking over the right amount of money's here. And when you change people at the desk every hour or two, it's just a lot of staff time. So this, because this is a locked, uh, sort of a locked unit, they don't have to do that. So the staff will still maybe help someone use the kiosk, but they don't have to do a money handling situation. Does it, sorry, just does it take cash and yeah. card and everything? Well, that's cool. Yes, okay. it does. Um, we, we feel like it's an equity thing. Not everybody has yeah. bank. So we want to make sure that we take cash. Great. So it does take cash and card. Thank you. All right. I'm going to be presenting briefly on behalf of two of my colleagues. So um, Tat Kendrick is the director of our communications and marketing division. Um, he has provided you with a copy of our new emergency grab and go response handbook. Um, and this is a project that we've been working on for a while to help staff who are in the midst of a crisis or emergency to have something that they can grab um, that includes um, information about whom they should be contacting, um, where emergency exits and, and uh, equipment may be, um, especially if they've had to leave and you know somebody comes in and doesn't know how to turn off the power or the water. Um, information about dealing generally with emergencies. Um, so it's not our exhaustive emergency handbook. It, it's just the stuff that you may need to know in, in a pinch in, in the moment. Um, and then specific guidance on various emergencies and situations that you may encounter. So, and Amelia? Yeah, I'd just like to comment on this. One of the things um, we met with Cressa, which is the Clark Regional Emergency Services Association, I believe it's, or agency. Um, and one of their suggestions to us was that in an emergency, it's frequently common that someone in your building is trained in some way, whether they're a nurse or an EMT or a, you know even a volunteer firefighter, they may have some skills. And so their suggestion was that we put these out in public areas as well. So you, in the future, you'll see these out in our libraries in, in public areas so that if, if an emergency occurs, one of those first responders who might be in the building would have the opportunity to also grab this and have access to it and be helpful in that moment. So um, when you see them, that's why it'll be also so out in public areas. All right, and I'll pass it off to my colleague, Lee. Yeah, absolutely. So this is provided to staff or to the public? Uh, both. We'll, we have it available in our staff areas, and we also plan to make it available in our public areas. Um, is there a uh, motion for staff to review this ahead of time? Yes, staff have looked at this very thoroughly. This is this has been through many, many iter iterations and drafts. Thank you. Of course, thank you. No, no, I'm not so short you have to put it down. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I am sitting in 
you know, doing the work of the, the district and HR hiring people, but there's a few highlights that I wanted to share. One is that we had our biggest NEOs, new employee orientation since 2020. This last week, we had six new employees join us and it was really exciting to, uh, you know, NEO is often a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. So all the leadership team goes in to talk to them and there's one person and seven of us, and it can be a bit intimidating to them on their first day. So it's really exciting to have some new faces coming in. Um, we have retooled our substitute pool. So we have a pool of 35 employees that serve as substitutes. And we were experiencing a lot of empty shifts, unfilled shifts. So we did some retooling and it has worked well in that we've only had, let's see, fewer unfilled shifts. We only had nine out of 209 shifts this last month that were unfilled. So it really helps us keep the libraries open, to decrease stress on employees by having those substitutes are a really great resource for us. Um, the, uh, one of our unions, uh, American Federation of State, County and Municipal Employees, filed a bargaining unit clarification with the Public Employee Relations Commission that's a lot of acronyms, but uh, they believe that there are 16 positions that should be part of their bargaining unit. They have filed this petition. It goes to PERC for review, and we've been having mediation sessions on that. So we've been spending some time on that. We conduct. Could you tell us what level those positions are at, the 16 positions? Uh, they're, they're a whole myriad of them. There's some managers and some coordinators and... Um, Trying to think one last one. Managers and coordinators. Are these positions that aren't in the union now that they Correct. want to bring? They're non-represented the right now, okay. and they believe that the work belongs to their bargaining unit. Thanks. Um, PERC does mediation sessions before you go to a full-blown hearing. So if you're able to kind of work through in, um, the, the process without a full-blown hearing, they do that. We conducted an environmental assessment of our operations center this last month, uh, we had some concerns that there was mold in the building and that there were some other uh, environmental challenges. We were, uh, we had someone come in. We do not have mold in our building. We've done some things in our restrooms downstairs to try uh, to mediate some challenges we were having. We had a uh, leak in a system that provides water to the P traps in the floor, the letter P. <laughs> um, in our floor and that had a leak in it. And that leak, the piping went up through the ceiling, probably too much information, but we ended up with a leak. Uh, we don't have mold, have a happy ending. Um, and so just wanted to let you know, we spent some resources on that. And then I'm beginning preparation for bargaining with WPEA and AFSCME. Uh, we have a three-year contract with each of those unions that expires at the end of the year. So we start getting ready now. We'll begin bargaining with WPEA in May of this year to, um, to uh, bargain a successor contract to the one that's currently there. Thank you. I think I broke it. <laughs> Is that good? You sure? Okay, cool. All right, for our public services or our locations, um, one big thing that occurred and we just got some gorgeous pictures out of it was that uh, snowy weather we had at the end of February. So um, we have our Yakult, well, this is outside of our Yakult library. It got real bad in Yakult. So <laughs> um, uh, we have our La Center library looking just beautiful with that white roof and our Yale Valley, um, uh, our uh, Yale Valley Library Express. So or library, um, community library. So just wanted to show you some of that. We did close early that Wednesday that the snow came down and we were closed all day Thursday. And then we had some late openings Friday and Saturday. So just a heads up that that happened. But even with the snow, we saw just gangbuster attendance at our program. So um, you can see here, um, we've got Cascade Park on the left there. That's a, a story time. Up on the top, you've got... Um, candy sushi making at La Center, which was a, a tween program and very well attended. And on the right there, on the bottom there, we've got, um, that's our Woodland Community Library and a story time afterwards, um, playing with some paint and making some art. So um, just want to, just wanted to reassure you that even if, even when we do close, when we reopen, we are just very full. In fact, that candy sushi program, um, I believe occurred um, when school was closed, but the libraries were open. So and on behalf of, um, what was there? Oh, yes. 
So we have an inclement, we don't have a policy, we have an inclement weather guidelines. Um, and, um, and they help us to identify um, um, how we go about doing it. So um, essentially it starts with me waking up at about 4.30 in the morning, uh, checking weather reports, um, getting a report from our facilities director, Dave Josephson, who drives in from Yakult. So he gets to see a good portion of our service area and give me some good understanding of what the road conditions are like. I look at traffic cameras. Um, and then I check in with all of our um, managers and supervisors, depending on who's working that day. So they get a text from me very early in the morning asking for, you know, how are things going? Can you feel the staff today? Can you get people in? Um, that Thursday, it was, it was a real no brainer. You know, that one was a clear, you know, we do wait until the morning of, because oftentimes, as you know, weather reports are wrong and, um, and, you know, they'll say it's going to snow overnight, two inches, and then nothing even hits the ground. And how terrible would it be if we had announced we were closed and then it's a beautiful day outside. So we, yes. And then we have a whole process for alerting folks. We post on um, our websites. We post an alert on our website. Um, we post an alert on social media and, um, and then we of course communicate to all staff. We have a commitment to get that announcement out by six 30. So that staff who have a fairly long commute, have an opportunity to check their email and know that they don't need to go in. And, um, so that that's our process. You're welcome. Of course. Um, Justin Keeler is our Outreach and Community Partnerships Director. He is unfortunately um, not able to be here also. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what he's been up to and what his um, division has been up to. Um, we are uh, knee deep in summer at your library preparation. You may think it's only March. Yep. <laughs> we start planning pretty much the 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 two weeks after our summer at your library um, ends. So it's, a, it's quite a heavy lift. So we're working on... Um, uh, coordinating uh, programs as well as um, uh, as as well as um, uh, materials and our marketing materials for that. Spring and summer outreach planning is in full swing as well. The weather starts to get better. We get a lot of requests to come out to different programs to table to tell people about our library. A lot of school. We do a lot of school outreach at the end of the year to try to um, drum up support for summer at your library. So um, that is. Uh, happening right now. And our branches coordinate and do a lot of their own um, outreach in their immediate area. But because the demand is so large over the spring and summer, um, our outreach and community partnerships division intentionally coordinates that work to help um, staff collaborate so that um, they can they can both staff their libraries as well as get out into the community. And I wanted to just share that we have a new, um, it's not that new, but we're it had some updates. And so we're relaunching uh, what we call LibConnect, which is a partner database. It um, allows us to share information across our locations about projects that we're working on with partners and who owns a contact so that um, folks who are, say, here in Clark County um, can share um, if they wanted to reach out to the food bank, they would know uh, who on staff they could reach out to to ask um, to get in, in to get in to get to connect with them in order to um, do a program or something like that. So it's just a way to help us stay a little bit more organized and to ensure we're not um, four of us all approaching the same partner and looking like we're not coordinating. So that's a big part of what our OCP division does. And I believe that's it, unless there are any questions. Lib Connect. Mm -hmm. So that's for staff use. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of modeled off um, like sales contact, um, like a Salesforce type contact database. Um, it has options for you to put in information about different interactions that you've had so that you can track a relationship over time. So it's kind of like a relation management tool. Um, we're mostly just using it for tracking and for um, helping to, like I said, to coordinate um, the requests that we're making of partners, um, especially as we are more intentionally um, getting out into the community. And we're, we're very much because of our strategic plan um, demands that we get out and we are seeking non-users and trying to connect with communities who haven't historically been using our libraries robustly. And um, we just want to ensure that um, as we start that work, that we're not all asking the same partners kind of over and over again, you know, it's Dia de los Muertos is coming up. And so everybody's contacting the one or two Latinx organizations in the community. We want to make sure that we're coordinating that ask so that, um, so that we're, we're creating the best partnership that we can. So who's using, who's usually using it? So like every branch has somebody using it? Yeah. All, um, all of our staff who have connecting with the community 
um, outside of their buildings as part of their job description. So that would be our um, senior library assistants who do programming and outreach on behalf of their location, our librarians and our branch managers. Um, and then of course our staff who work centrally, but also do a lot of that coordinating work. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. Oh, yes. Regarding the WPEA contract that you mentioned, what is that regarding? The collective bargaining agreements for both unions expire at the end of 2023. We're bargaining a successor contract with both organizations. Okay. Is that related? Is that the pay? salaries uh, it includes wages and compensation and health benefits so it's all the conditions of employment that are in the contract okay so i have follow up question with you like in the last i last items we had discussed that you know for represented versus non represented employees and you know who would be benefiting with that is that sorted out yet or? that was what so lee was talking about perk and we don't know when that will get sorted out, or do we have a sense of when PERC will make that decision of the non-represented employees? No. Um, that's not his question. Sorry. So in, in the last bargaining uh, that was done last year, right, it was that the contracts were negotiated by non-represented employees, ah. but the, you know. This... I know what you're talking about, and it's this is just the unions. This does not include the non-represented employees. That was a uh, salary study that we had done for all of our positions. This is just the collective bargaining agreements for the two unions. So it doesn't include um, those job descriptions or um, those classifications. That's a that was a separate thing that we did. But will will that bargaining agreement also be applicable to the non-represented employees? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, looks like up next is Three Creeks Community Library Report with Elizabeth Moss. Hello, I would like to welcome you to the Three Creeks Library and we're so glad that we were able to host you today. And Mary's getting my presentation up and I will get I'll be confident as I click. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the library. So we are the Three Creeks Community Library. We were founded in 2002. Our last refresh was done in 2014. So we're looking forward to a refresh next year. Our name comes from the three creeks that are in our service area, the Salmon, the Whipple, and the Cougar Creek. But the most important part of our name is the community part. This is very much a community library. When Fred Myers announced that they were going to be building their store here, it was the local neighborhood associations that went to Fred Myers and said, we need a library here. Please give us this space. Don't put another fast food restaurant or a gas station here. Please give us a library. And then they negotiated with Fred Myers and they came to FERL and said, we need a library here. We talked to Fred Myers, please build us a library. And we have such a wonderful community and they support us and they love us and we love them. And we are so happy that we are able to be here for them. So a couple of the statistics from 2022, we had 296,041 checkouts this past year, which is an increase from 2021 when we're almost 22% of an increase in terms of our curbside pickups. Even though people can come into the library, it's been such a huge thing for people who have trouble with mobility, for people who have young babies that they don't want to wake up and come get their holds. So we've had over 1,100 curbside pickups this year, even as the library has been open. And we are so happy that we are able to provide that service for them. We've had 117,918 visitors in 2022, which was another increase. This is over 85% from 2021. And library new cards, 1,144. Our area is growing and we are seeing these new patrons and it is wonderful to welcome them to our library. 
And we couldn't do it without our staff. We have a wonderful staff of 14. We have the supervisory staff, myself as a branch manager. We have a branch operations manager and a senior public services librarian who's in charge of our youth program. Then we have two senior library assistants who focus a lot on programming and outreach. And then we have nine public service assistants who are doing everything else from the checking in to the helping patrons. And we are all such a wonderful team. And I could not be here today sharing the wonderful statistics with you if it wasn't for them. I'd like to take some time to talk about the types of patrons we see in the library and how they are using our service. So we have a magazine area that we try to keep as a quiet area. And so pretty much any time you come in, you're going to find people sitting, reading quietly. We have a jigsaw puzzle that the community comes together and they work on and they build. We have uh, word searches and paper wordles and daily crosswords that we put out so people can come and relax and enjoy a quiet afternoon at the library. We also have a lot of students who come in and use our library, whether it's for looking up entertainment books to read for pleasure or whether it's looking for school assignments, and we're here to help them. Recently, there was a high school student who was writing a paper on violence in the Middle East, and he was having a hard time coming up with the right search terms because if you search violence in the Middle East on our databases, it's there's a lot. And so staff were able to help him narrow his search, find the right search terms. And he was just so excited. Yes, that's going to make my paper. That's going to make my paper. And we love being able to see, see it when it clicks, when they learn about our homework help, when they learn about that, or when they just get the last bad guys book that they've been waiting to read. So we have a lot of kids that use our library. And we're so happy to provide those services. We also have a lot of families that use our library. Our story times, we have 30 kid spots in each of our story times, and most of the time it fills up because they love coming to us. We have a lot of grandparents that bring their children. We have a lot of parents that bring their children. We have a lot of caregivers that bring their children, and they come and they play with the bubbles, and they get all of those early learning tips. We put a huge focus on how can you help your child get ready for kindergarten, get ready to become a reader. So we make sure and we include those tips with every story time. We also have a lot of teens that use the library. We are in very close proximity to Skyview High School, Alki Middle School and others. So we have after school, you can pretty much guarantee there's gonna be teens on the computer, teens on the Wi-Fi coming to use it. We also have a great Dungeons and Dragons program that just this month we started back in person and it's such a great opportunity they come because it's fun they get to meet new friends but the secret is they're also learning team building skills problem solving and so much math so we love being able to do something that they enjoy that's fun that also is helping support their educational pursuits we have patrons who we don't interact with much at all they place holds they come they pick up they use self-checkout and we're happy to be there for them. But we also have a lot of patrons who come to us because they don't have anywhere else to go and they don't know where to go next. We had a patron who came to me wanting a death certificate and possibly a, an obituary for a child that she gave up for adoption. She didn't know his name. She didn't know when he died. It was either in September or October of you know this certain year. She knew his birth date and she knew his birthplace and that's all she had to go on. And it was a closed adoption. She couldn't get any information. And she came to us and said, can you please help me find my son? And it was an impossible task, but we did it. We went through obituary after obituary after obituary. And not only were we able to find him through uh, newspaper databases uh, in a small town in Oregon, we were able to find yearbook pictures. So she was able to see her son as he grew up. And where else could she go get that information? We help people with that, well, not that specific situation, but people with problems, they don't know where to go. They don't know how to fill out SNAP benefits or find low-income housing or help apply for a job. And we're able to be there for them and help give them the support that they need. 
I mentioned before our early literacy, we have a lot of programs that focus on early literacy, but we've also designed our space. This is a rocket ship that is so much fun to play with, but it's developing all of those early literacy skills, fine motor skills, matching skills, letters, helping them explore the world in a very constructive way. We also have areas where they can make new friends. Kids make new friends so easily. And it's so great that these are two little boys who never knew each other. And they started deciding to build a train and they were gonna build the best train set that they could. And they became friends because they met at the library. So it's wonderful that we're able to offer that, play, that type of opportunity. We also have a vibrant outside area. This is a frog statue that our friends donated a few years ago by the book returns in our courtyard. If you have a chance, go out and see our xylophone complete with music notations that they can learn to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star or Old MacDonald Had a Farm. We have a giant chess set and checkers board. We have hopscotch out here. We have a alphabet caterpillar and a garden which will very soon be planted as a pizza garden so the toddlers can water it and grow food that then we can have a pizza party that they can put toppings on that they grew themselves so we really try to utilize all of our space inside and out and programs this is one of our stem programs with lego building that we then take those lego creations and we put them on display in the library so that kids can see that their work is valued and important. We have lots of arts and crafts programs that help engage the kids and help develop that artistic side and those artistic skills. We also have a lot of adult programs. This is a picture from November. We had Peter Ali, who is a Native American flautist, who brought a whole variety of different flutes, shared with us some music that he composed, some music that he learned, and talked about his own personal journey of healing through music. And we try to get a wide variety of programs to interest a wide variety of members of our community. This was one of the first uh, adult programs we brought back after COVID. And it was so wonderful to see people enjoying programs in the library again. And story times. We love story times. The kids love story times. They're great. The bubbles are, if you were to ask the kids what are their favorite parts of the library. It's gonna be the train cables and it's gonna be the bubbles. We have an amazing bubble machine and it's teaching them the fine motor skills that they pop the bubbles. It teaches them how to play gently with their friends and it just brings so much joy to their faces. And that's what we love to see. When people leave the library, we love to see them smiling. We love to see them happy. And that's one of our goals. I want to talk about some of our amazing partnerships. This is Ren Locus. So they are one of our tax help partners and we have just worked with them on creating year round tax help. So right now they're doing a lot of stuff every Friday and Saturday, except today. And they're also going to be providing year round tax help, focusing on people with low income, people who uh, are English language learners and people with disabilities and they're going to be helping provide tax help year round. This picture of the kids, they worked with us on the financial literacy program for children, where the children could play carnival games and earn coins that they could then spend to create decoration for their piggy bank or save. And if they saved even one coin, they could get a free book provided by Ren Locus. Plus it gave our tax partners the opportunity to introduce the new Washington tax credit for children. Uh, while their kids were playing, the parents were learning how they can save money on their taxes. So that was a wonderful partnership. We work a lot with the schools. These are pictures from Skyview High School. The orchestra and choirs came and did a concert for our patrons and their Stormbots robotics team came and did both an in-person and a virtual program aimed at elementary kids, teaching them about robotics, about problem solving, all of those STEM skills. We also go to Lakeshore Elementary School once a week to provide a story time for those families who can't make it to the library. And this summer, we're going to Hazeldale Elementary School to do a summer program with them with the Reptile Man. So all sorts of fun stuff coming from these partnerships in our community. And we have so many more. Repair Clark County is wonderful. They repair things from our community with volunteers for free, which is amazing. The Lutheran Community Services Northwest. I actually got to go and do a Ramadan themed story time 
for a group of Afghan families celebrating their very first Ramadan in the U.S. since becoming refugees. And it was amazing. And thanks to our wonderful partners, we've partnered with Share to do drives for uh, socks and underwear and diapers and menstrual products, all to benefit members in their community in need. And we like to go out and help the kids after school programs. Uh, we did a whole year's worth of after school educational programs with kids, fun and fitness and virtual programs. We have virtual Dungeons and Dragons, virtual kid groups. Even though we're bringing back our in-person programs, we are so committed to keeping the virtual programs. Not everybody can get to the library, especially when you're a kid and you're dependent on your parents taking you places. So we have been so grateful that we've been able to keep the staffing to do these virtual programs because it has made a huge world of difference for these kids. Some new things from this year, we got a new AMH. We had the very first AMH in the whole library district. Sorry, thank you. An automatic materials handling machine or the <laughs> check-in machine. People can check it in. They can now get a receipt that says that they checked in which books mm -hmm. and it sorts it out for staff. So it checks them in and sorts it into various spins so that they can do their jobs more efficiently. Our old machine, was decades old running on Windows XP and breaking down to the point where everybody knew IT's phone number uh, by heart. This one is so much more efficient. It is so much more accurate and it has been wonderful to have. We also got new fax machines. So patrons can fax for free at the library, which is something they've been asking for for a long time. So we're glad we were able to do that. And I know Lynn talked, but we are the pilot program for the new cash kiosk payments. And it's been three days so far and staff are loving it. We've had a couple of patrons use it and it's been such an amazing tool. So we're so grateful that we are able to keep our technology up to date so we can provide the best services for our patrons. And I have to mention our friends group. We have an amazing friends group. This is from their book Teak that they did in December where they sold books and raised funds for the library. It's because of them that we are able to bring in as many performers, that we're able to do as much. And it's because they support us. They support us financially. They support us emotionally. They, they're our cheerleaders. They love the library. They are some of our best supporters and we would not be here without our friends group. And I just wanted to close with this picture because this really, encapsulates to me what our library is about. It's about people connecting with each other, with books, with our services. And that is, is what we're about, is connecting with our community. So we are so glad that we're able to connect with you guys here today. And thank you so much. And I'm now able to answer any questions you may have. <laughs> Elizabeth, I have a question. Yes. The receipt to return a book. Mm -hmm. Are you, is that new here? Or are you a test pilot for the system, the district, so, or how does that work? I haven't heard of It's that. part of the machine software program. So you can get one here at the Three Creeks Library. The Cascade Park Library also got a new AMH from the same company. If you return it on their outside drop, you can get a receipt. If you return it inside, you can't. Okay. The Vancouver oh. Community Library also got one, but they don't have a patron interface. It's only for staff use. So there are currently two libraries where you can get a receipt and we are one of them. That is super. You can, you can also choose no receipt if you don't want one, but it's been something that our patrons have really enjoyed. Good. Any other questions? So for that AMH, can it not just email? Like for the inside, when you check out, it gives you an option instead of receipt to get an email. It does not have the email option because it would require more permissions. Lynn can speak to more specifically, but it would require more in-depth connection with our, our yes. ILS system <laughs> uh, because it would need to look up patron accounts and email addresses. And this way it, doesn't have it knows which books it checks in because it knows the title of the books but it doesn't access any patron records of 
email addresses and things like that. Is that option available or that's far too ahead? I will let Lynn speak more to these technical <laughs> questions. Um, we we have not chosen to do that, and anyone that can look up their account and see that the things are gone now, and staff can also do that for patrons. They come inside at a place that doesn't have a patron induction that gives a receipt. They can just say, I want to make sure everything's off my account, and they can print for them what's on their account still so that they can see that it is not there. Right. That, that option is there when we check out also. We have this self-help chaos so that we don't involve the staff right and it would be just a good feature to have any other questions well, i actually just want to say thank you and bravo it, uh, i'm really inspired by your enthusiasm i love all the plants in your library i love the space that you've created quiet space the flow of everything um it just seems like you guys are thriving, and I appreciate you sharing all of this. Thank you. I have to say the plants are due to my wonderful staff. I do not have a green thumb. The fact that they are alive means I have wonderful staff who have those skills. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next up is financial statements with Atar Bengal. Did I say your name correctly? Bengal, thank you. All right, starting with our um, cash position. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, January revenues were $139,000 and expenditures $2.5 million. The year-to-date cash balance was at $18.4 million. And then moving to revenues. The statement of revenues on the second page. Thank you. All right, for January, um, property tax revenue totaled $66.7,000. Uh, January's uh, other general tax revenue was $22.2,000, which was specifically um, private harvest tax from Skamania County. Leasehold excise tax came in at $7,300,000. January um, intergovernmental revenues uh, included $5,800,000 for federal in lieu and $3,600,000 for state forest board. Um, and then January uh, charges for services totaled $2,800,000. Under miscellaneous, um, January investment interest revenue was $28,000. And so uh, total January revenue was $139,000. And then moving on to expenses. So at the end of January, we would expect um, total expenses year to date to be at 8.33% of budget. Uh, January personnel costs were $1.4 million. Supplies and small equipment for the month of January was $72,000, with year-to-date at 4.9% of budget. January library materials and e-resources activity uh, was $247,000, with year-to-date at 6.5% of budget. The um, January uh, subtotal for other services charges was $315,000. And then capital outlay in January had $522,000 of activity for buildings owned, um, consisting of an, an installment payment on the uh, VA carpet replacement, initial payment to contractor UCC for the Grand Boulevard building remodel and architect fees for the Woodland Library uh, building. Year-to-date budget percentage for total expenditures is at 7.61%. Questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes our reports. We'll move on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the consent agenda as presented? So moved. 
Is there a second to move the consent agenda as approved? I'll second. Any further discussion? I move this to a vote. We're we're gonna do roll call for all today. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Megan Dugan. Aye. Olga Hodges. Aye. Vikram Katwani. Aye. Penny Love Hensley. Aye. Marie Coffey. Aye. Marianne Duncan Cole. Aye. And Kirsty Morgan. Aye. Penny, um, you did the um, expenditure. Yes, I went through the bills this month in the office and looked at them all. They were all in order. We spent a total of $770,113.59. Thank you. We're going to move on to the business section. First up is the employee handbook policy. Yes. So tonight we are providing you with the um, employee handbook, uh, which is a board approved policy. And it's a red line. So you can see what was there before and what has been added. Um, this is uh, not even a first reading. This is just a review. So this gives you, because it's quite lengthy, uh, this will give you this coming month to have a chance to look at this and provide feedback to the policy committee if you have any questions or concerns about this um, particular policy. Um, it's one of those things we have to do as a wholesale um, upgrade, and we don't do it very often. I think the last time we upgraded the policy was maybe three years ago, 2018. So it's been a while. So there's quite a few things in there. Um, we are folding in a couple of other policies, um, political Paraphernalia is one of them, and the other one, I think it's um, discrimination and um, anti-harassment and then equal opportunity employment. Those are policies that have been administrative policies for us that really, in our minds, because they apply strictly to our employees, probably are better suited to be within the employee handbook rather than standalone policies. So we'd like to, as we uh, complete this and approve this policy, we'll be able to sunset those three policies out of our uh, administrative policy group. If we have a question. Um, me? Okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I'll be your conduit to leave. So I don't know that there's any discussion yeah. on it tonight. Did yeah, anybody have quick discussion quick. or questions tonight? Or I know no one's really probably looked through it yet. It's okay. Are you going ready for the 2023 budget document? Yes. Yeah. So we've passed out to you a copy. This is um, the budget you approved back in December. Um, accompanying it is our narrative. And this is what we provide to uh, elected officials, uh, municipalities, counties, um, other uh, governmental agencies um, in our service area to just inform them about uh, what FERO activities um, are for the coming year, as well as our statistics from the prior year. So um, earlier today, uh, that was mentioned that we provide this information. Um, this is the document that we send out. Um, we just wanted to be sure you had a copy of it. It'll also be available online. Um, but it, you know, it talks a little bit about governance. It talks about um, how our uh, funding is structured, um, and that gives details about the budget from 2022 to 2023. So you can kind of see the progression um, over the last you know, two years. And this is your operating budget. It's it's both operating and capital. Okay. Yeah, we have a combined budget. Sorry. Any questions about that? Did you have anything further? No, okay. it's, it's really just, a, this is an informational uh, piece. I just wanted to be sure you were aware of this document and that it'll be available online. Thank you. We're ready to move on to um, our first uh, action item, which is resolution 2023-9, the material recovery fee. We're gonna ask Lynn um, Caldwell to come up and speak to this. Sorry. <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh. Hello. <laughs> it's me again, Lynn. And I'm here to talk to you about our materials recovery process. So just for some background for you, confidence. Um, FBRL stopped charging late fees in 1970. So it's been 53 years. Um, so it's just not something we've ever done. Um, we do bill people though, if it, if your item is four weeks overdue, we send you a bill for it. And in between then we send you overdue notices and things. It's not a surprise when you get a bill. It shouldn't be a <laughs> surprise. Um, so at four weeks past due, we send you uh, a bill. And then in 2006, we started using unique recovery, uh, unique library services, and they're located in Jeffersonville, Indiana. So I have a little soft spot for them because I'm a Hoosier. And uh, they're in Jeffersonville, Indiana, which is right across the Ohio River from Louisville, Kentucky. And in Louisville, there's this really big um, Baptist seminary. And back in the early 2000s, most of their employees were students at the Baptist seminary. So their gentle nudge recovery program was pretty gentle, you know, <laughs> it was nice kids. Um, they provide for us. Um, so, so in 2006, we started sending things that were eight weeks past due to Unique. And they would provide, click, letters, phone calls, and address corrections. And address corrections is one of the most important things they did for us. So people move around a lot, and maybe they didn't even get the overdue notice or the bill because they moved, and the address, did, the uh, letter didn't get forwarded. So um, they provide those address corrections for us. And you know, it's all very confidential. They just we provide the text of the letter. Jewel recently was updating it for us and, and working with TAC, our communications director on that. Um, and so it, it's confidential. So it might say, dear so-and-so, you have some items that are past due or long past due from this library. Please call this number and talk to them about it. And it would provide our telinfo number. So um, very gentle. But the goal is just to get the materials back and to get the patron back in good standing with the library because we want them to be able to use their card again. And our, our practice right now, our policy with a lowercase p, I guess, <laughs> is that if you owe $25 or more in billed items, you can't use your card. So, and once it gets to $40, we were sending you to Unique to be um, reminded gently. <laughs> so uh, back to closer to now in 2020, uh, March of 2020 with the pandemic, we closed our libraries for a while, and we thought it wasn't really fair to send people to um, advanced uh, contact, escalated contact with Unique, because at that time, we didn't know how COVID was spread. And we said, don't even bring the stuff back, just keep it for now. And we, <laughs> we, we locked our book drops, you know, a lot of libraries all over the country locked their book drops. It wasn't just us, you know. Um, so we just kept moving the date due forward. You know, these aren't, don't worry about it. We moved the date due, it's not overdue. Just keep it for now. So we basically stopped using Unique um, in March of 2020, Megan's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> it was true. <laughs> um, so while we were, and then we opened back up for limited service like curbside, we still didn't use Unique because people were uncomfortable. We were just gauging the, the temperature of our community and it was not quite comfortable yet going to the library necessarily so um we still didn't use unique but now it's three years later and we really feel like we should reestablish our relationship with them so what we're asking for tonight is that we reestablish our relationship with unique library services um but that instead of sending people for that escalated contact at 40 dollars, i'd like to move it up to 60 you know, I'd like someone to, just the cost of material, you know, I, I don't want it to be just one book they have or something. And we're like, hey, bring it back. We're, we're after you. Um, so I'd like to move it to $60. And yeah, yeah. This is based on the average cost of an adult uh, item being $30. Yeah, yeah, right. That's correct. You know, trade paperbacks are 15, you know, kids, picture books. I think we have them at 15. What do we have them at, Jewel? Uh, kids' picture books, are they $20? So, you know, at $60, it would be maybe three picture books they would have past due. Um, so I would also like us to consider the referral fee. We call it a referral fee. We pay unique library services. It's $9 and change. 
um, to do this for us. But we feel like it saves us a lot of staff time. We don't have time for staff to be calling everybody that's overdue and trying to leave messages. And then the address corrections are really helpful as well. And we don't, we can't do that. Um, so in the past, we added a $10 fee to everyone's account that we had sent to Unique. Um, as we called it a referral fee because they were referred to Unique. And even after you brought all your stuff back and you only owed $10, which is under the $25 limit we usually have for, for using your card, um, we still didn't let you use your card as long as you had that $10 on. Um, because it was still, it was like, well, we sent you to this extra, we had to do this extra work, extra trouble. You cost us $9 and change. So now you have to give us another $10. So I feel like it's just the cost of doing business and that we shouldn't do that any longer, that if we if they're providing these services for us, we appreciate it, we're getting value out of it, but that we shouldn't any longer pass that on to the customer. That's my recommendation. Over a year, how much, over a year, how much money are we talking about? I'm gonna get to money in just a second. <laughs> um, most people have accounts in good standing, you know. So I also would like us to consider removing the $10 that's on people's account now. If we're going to not charge it going forward, I feel like if someone came up and complained to staff and said, oh, please take this $10 off, I think they would fill out a waiver request form for Jewel to review and probably she would waive it, you know, because it's not really that $10 is is the cost of doing business. It's not like they still have an item that's ours that that we've given them, you know, quote unquote. Um, so I feel like it would be the fair thing to do. Um, so of the accounts right now, I also want to remind you that every six years, accounts that, that have money owed to us that are six years old or older, at the end of that six years, when you get into year seven, we remove them um, because the auditor says we can. They're just uncollectible debt at that point. So we just remove those bills af after the end of six years. So some of these... We have 1,902 account holders right now who only owe us the $10. Uh, that's all they owe. Um, and so those people would be in good standing right away if we got rid of the old $10. They could start using their, their accounts right away. Um, the remaining, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, anyone that owes that referral fee, even if that's the only thing they owe, they've already brought their books back, they're not allowed to use their card to check out. And it's all adults, right? Or is it minors too? It's it's minors too. It, it's anyone with a library card that is overdue. Oh. And and when they send letters and things, if it's a minor account, the letter says to the parents of your child has <laughs> overdue materials from library. It doesn't say that the, the names of the materials, just overdue materials from the library. Can you tell me real quick, is it Mostly adults or kids? Yeah, um, oh, it's 80 something percent of our card holders are adults. Okay. So most of these are adults. Did you have a question as well? Yes. Oh, so when they return the books, do we charge them late fees for those items? No, we haven't charged late fees since 1970. Okay, so uh, many libraries now have started doing that and they and they are like, oh, FERL is like the the queens of, <laughs> you know, not charging late fees as we've done it, not done it for 50 years. And if they find the materials, so bring them back super late. So if they, no matter how late they bring them back, if the bill is still on there, the bill goes away for the item. Um, and then all that might remain is that $10. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah, everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so that's what I'm asking you to do right now with this um, resolution. Yes, you have a question. Uh, so you have you have 1,900 uh, account holders that have a fee, mm -hmm. and the um, amount owing that we would be waiving is the 50,969 right. for those 1902. Right. So there's about 6,000 accounts right now that have. Um, it's not exactly 6,000 because sometimes people pay part of it. You know, a gotcha. few dollars towards it. Mm -hmm. Are you? I guess one of the things if we go ahead and approve it would be to monitor this and say, here's our record in 2023 um, with, with the uh, penalty fee. And then see what happens in five years. Um, are we getting good response or have those outstanding just left? Okay, sure. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And one yep. more. 
Oh, sorry, there I am. <laughs> if we forgive the first time they have this referral fee that they don't pay, if it happens again, would we charge them the next go round? Yes. Yes. So yes. Every time an account one. is referred. Right. Right. In the past, if you if you if going forward we don't charge the ten dollars, then all. they they you wouldn't we we would be paying it as a cost of doing business because they would be getting, they might live somewhere else, you know, new letters, new phone calls. So there's not a, you get one free ride, but then the next time you go back through collections and there's $10. So I'm, I'm saying that that would be the cost of doing business. Okay, so we're never going to come back and say you owe us for. I think she's cost. asking to remove the $10 from now on and also forgive the past $10. Exactly. Is that right? Okay. Exactly. Okay. So how do we track the repeat offenders? There will be a certain set of people. We we forgive them. They would just have <laughs> they they, they would just have overdue books and then they would bring the books back. And we wouldn't track yeah. it because the books came back. So yeah. right. But there there would be certain repeat offenders. So it's it, like we will be spending yeah. money towards, you know, yeah. maybe a few hundred people, but those are repeats. So is there a way to track them to that's we, something to we, them. we don't do that. I mean, we just don't do that. We we don't say you have a black mark now because you had all these overdue books before. It's not something we do. I think and, some, what we can ask is keep a monitor going, not on basic um, offenders, but just how much. And was that $10 fee helping us or hurting us? Right. Is, is it worth it or not? Because mm -hmm. it has a cost to, um, is it called unique? Yes, and less than 50%, we went back and checked since 2018, less than 50% of the $10 fees have ever been paid. So and a lot of times they just sit there and no one ever pays them. And I, I want to repeat, um, just to just to make it hammer this home, is that, um, so a patron checks out three books. Um, they get those books for three weeks. The initial due date is usually that, that three weeks. If nobody else has requested those books, they get automatic renewals for many, many, many more weeks. So, and we, yeah, I know <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, and so, um, often they've had these books for three months and nobody's requested them. Um, when we, when we would refer them to unique, um, we would first, we bill them for the books. They'd get an, an announcement that said, Hey, we're billing you for these books and say total that bill came to $60. Now they have a $60 bill on their account. And then after that four weeks, then they get referred to unique and we, we assess that $10 fee. At that point, Unique calls them and says, hey, you got our books. And they're like, oh, yeah, they're sitting right here in my foyer. I'm going to bring them in. And they do. They bring all those books back. We have them back. And that $10 sits on their account, and it blocks them from using their account. So these 32% of the accounts that have this fee assessed to them, 1,900 cardholders could be using their cards except for this one $10 fee that's just sitting there preventing them from using their card. Question. The um, are any of those possibly just account holders that have relocated? Sure, sure, yes, yes. yeah. Sure. Okay, <laughs> what's your guess about the percentage of that? No way to know. Oh, come on, gamble a little. <laughs> I can make Love something paper. up. <laughs> Jewel, an educated guess from our circulation services coordinator. <laughs> Okay. Uh, she's Jewel. making that up. No. Jewel mentioned <laughs> just an educated guess from her expertise. Maybe a, maybe 20% have moved out of the area since getting that fee assessed. So they wouldn't be using their card even if we did re uh, remove this fee. Do we have other ways of, you know, debt forgiveness? Like, do we look at low income options if someone maybe shows us SNAP benefit, Medicaid card, anything like that. So we do have something called a waiver request form. Um, and Jewel is our circulation coordinator over here. Uh, so often those get referred to Jewel. Um, branch managers and supervisors are authorized up to a certain dollar point to, we call it forgive. And usually it's like, this was stolen out of my car. Here's the police report. My house was on fire. Here's the fire report. You know, my grandma died. Somebody was in the hospital. Something was terrible, you know. Um, and we do forgive, I don't have the dollar amount in my head, how much, I think maybe last year was $11,000 that we forgave throughout the year. Yeah, we track it. Mm -hmm. yep. Oh, yeah. So I'll say that on the mic for you. 12% of our patrons have any bills at all. Most patrons are in good standing. 
<laughs> you know what? I confess, I I have a history. I have a history of being very bad at returning materials. And when I was young, just a quick story. When I was young, uh, immigrant kid, single mom, had to make life work around everybody else's schedule. I would, and I love books, and I would take out hordes of books, I'd be terrible at returning them sometimes. And then you get that letter in the mail, and you feel so much shame. You feel so horrible and you're already poor. And then I would just quit the library, you know? And um, it's, it, 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 it kind of shapes how when you're living in poverty, you experience a lot of systems. And so I love to hear that we have this charitable approach. Um, and I wonder, you know, where else we could extend it without having people to do, having to um, go through more contact points or it's like so vulnerable to be like can you please approve this I can't pay it can you please approve it so I kind of wonder if we can consider something as easy like well if you have a benefit card do you or you know not not prying too much but just making that access to clean slate a little quicker I kind of wonder if we could do that because this is a fantastic thing that we're doing to offer people access and a fresh start that's really what it's about I think the one thing we have to be mindful of is the gift of public funds, yes, which in yes. the state of Washington is, you know, something we have to consider. So um, we might look to how we might structure something. Um, and I, you know, again, I probably want to talk to someone like Dan Gottlieb about how would you structure that yeah. so that there would be a way, you know, maybe we reach out to the foundation and say, can you backfill this or can yeah. you do something to help? I suppose I really am thinking mostly too of just minors. Some kids don't have access to just 10 bucks to pop over, you know, and so I kind of wonder if we could start there. I just want to um, clarify your, your thinking here, your proposal or request for thinking further about this. It, are you saying, um, should you not approve this request today to remove that $10 fee um, that, uh, that, so you were speaking about the ten dollar fee. If, we, if we approve this and we remove the ten dollar fee, yeah. do you feel is this something that you would want us to explore if a patron is has not returned their books? Because if they return their books, then everything's clear. Right. Yeah, I, I get that this will give a clean slate to to most folks. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, let's let's definitely okay. do that if we can. And then I'm just wondering, like, if there are additional fees, um, if someone is coming back and can't check out, I, I'm in particular, I'm thinking of young people. Um, what can we do to just get them back into the habit? Yeah, of I would love to consider something like that. And I've got some ideas. So, <laughs> And one quick point. So if we go further and approve this, I think there should be these items should be tracked separately on the account. And we revisit that after a year, if we think that doing cost of doing business becomes a repeat habit for people, you know, and that I'm not sure how we would that. track that. Like you, whatever you are paying to Unique, that is your cost of doing business. If you know, if we, I mean, I could track the overall what we pay yeah, Unique, yeah. but not per individual. Yeah. At this point, that whole amount should be good enough. Yeah. Yeah, and then I, I've never uh, understood if someone doesn't return materials. That book, is that gone forever or do we reorder? It depends. Um, so after it's been so many months in this process or even a year or more in the process of being overdue, um, it eventually gets discarded from the system. The record gets discarded from our cataloging system. It's sort of like a behind the scenes thing. But anytime we go through the discard process, um, our selectors who purchase books, they get a list of the, all the things that have been discarded so that they can review the list to see if it's something they wanna reorder. And we also have a, a holds ratio uh, purchase uh, algorithm that we use. So if not, it's not an algorithm. It's just a ratio. Um, it's simple. Um, if we if we have if we own so many copies of a material and we have a, a ratio amount of uh, holds on that material, then we will purchase additional copies of that item. So, for example, if you have out the only copy of of, of some book and I want to purchase, I want to, I want to borrow it. And then Amelia wants to borrow it. That would trigger an alert to our collections team to, to look into purchasing this item because it's been out for so long and there's some demand. So 
we have other ways to to keep keep track of items that are just sitting in somebody's house for a very long time. And in general, do we have more than one copy of the book? It, it really depends yeah. on the book. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the book. <laughs> if we, it's we start out ordering usually two adult fiction and two nonfiction, depending on if, if we don't know that if it's going to be popular or not, you know. Um, and then if we know something's going to be popular because it's an author we always know is popular, we're going to order much more than that. Um, so it just depends. Thanks, Lynn. I have um, a question specifically about the resolution and the wording of it. Um, so in the first section, it says the Board of Trustees make library cards available to anyone living or owning property in the unincorporated areas of FURL's three counties. And I just wonder why that's called out specifically, because we also give cards to the incorporated areas. Okay, so I guess, um, and then my other issue is that it says that it's January 17th and we're at Cascade Park. So I would like that um, adjusted to March 18th at Three Creeks. And I would move that we take out the word unincorporated in the um, resolution. And with those changes, I move that we approve this. It was probably the unincorporated no, I don't know. It's just wrong. <laughs> it, it doesn't make any sense in that in that phrase. So I think we should take it out. Is there a motion yeah. to adopt resolution I'm, 2020? I moved with those amendments that we approved. Okay. Yes. Is there a second to move resolution 2023-9 material recovery fee as amended? I'll second it. Any further discussion? So are we in two date that that we come back to it after a year? Does that need to be in the resolution or is that just I, I think I would say we'll just, that would be a procedural. Are you comfortable with that? That's fine. As long as we keep track of that. Yeah. Can you clarify that? Are we coming back in a year to review this or see the, the impact. financial impact? Of okay. It. Mm -hmm. I move we uh i move this to a vote marianne duncan cole a vikram katwani aye olga hodges aye megan dugan aye penny love hensley aye and christy morgan aye and Marie Coffey. Aye. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Motion to approve resolution 2023-9 is adopted. Next, we'll move on to the surplus computer equipment. <laughs> With Amelia. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I think we'll put the resolution up. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we are required by law when we surplus um, certain uh, capital or um, equipment items to bring them to the board uh, for the approval of that surplus. Uh, and because this is quite a sizable list of computers, um, these are the um, units that we have um, pulled from use. They reach their um, five years of um, use under our you know current practice and so they they needed to be removed from the system before we can uh, put them out to sell, sell for surplus and we'll be selling them through a um, third party vendor that does surplusing for governmental agencies do we get new computers now oh yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. so this is pretty much all of last year's computers that were um, replaced so they're already taken off they're they, they're in storage yep they're in storage and we'd like to surplus them i just have one yeah i just have one comment <laughs> about the first sentence that says that we're meeting virtually and i would just take out the word virtually from that yeah, yeah. I actually do have a question for clarification that says um, the FERL Board of Trustees is authorized the purchase of items through budget approval and so are you talking about the budget we've already done and then this next part is the things we want to okay yep so for the surplus 
can we consider giving away these computers to schools or somebody? We cannot. Under state law, we can only give them away to agencies that serve the weak and poor and infirm. Poor and infirm. That's in state law. Okay. To agencies that serve the poor and infirm. Yes, that is. Uh, we wouldn't even know where to begin. The problem with giving away these computers is they have no operating systems. Um, so in order to put them out for surplus, we've stripped everything out of them. So there's no windows, there's no, you know, there's no operating system. So giving them to an agency, let's say that serves the poor, they would be receiving a bunch of computers with literally nothing on them. They'd have to buy the software, they'd have to, you know, load them. They'd have to know how to do those things. Um, it's just, it's a lot to ask of an agency. Most people don't want them um, when they're in this condition. Do you have a comment? No. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, very aware. Thanks. Other questions or discussion from the board? So in the past, uh, you guys had just sold it off to public. We have hosted public sales, and um, you know we maybe sell twelve computers, um, and it's a lot of staff time to put together a sale by using a third party vendor to help us with surplusing. Uh, they take care of that for us, and in the end, it, you know, often what we would do is we would wind up. Um, I hate to say it, but you know, trying to find someone who would either just take them off our hands or taking them to the landfill. Um, so we prefer giving them to a surplus company. Um, yeah. Yes, we'll get something for them. I can't guarantee what, but we'll get something. Is there a motion to adopt resolution 2023-10 surplus computer equipment? I make a motion that we accept 2023-10, the surplus of computers. Second. Any further discussion? I move this to a vote. Uh, Megan Dugan? Aye. Olga Hodges? Aye. Vikram Katwani? Aye. Mary Ann Duncan Cole? Aye. Marie Coffey? Aye. Penny Love Pensley? Aye. And Christy Morgan? Aye. Motion to approve resolution 2023 10 is adopted. Next, we are going to move on to the Foundation MOU Committee update. On Thursday, we had an online virtual meeting uh, with three members of the uh, Foundation. We started from the original agreement that was signed in 2016, and we decided we were going to do this because it was too hard to go back and forth through everything that's happened. So we started at the beginning. We agreed that this is a very general overview and that when it comes down to things like uh, IT services and graphic requests, we were going to put that in separate um, agreements. So we just basically went through and we're agreeing on things and we would like to, uh, it was proposed that we have a quarterly meeting uh, with the objectives for sharing plans and fundings and this quarterly meeting would be on the third Thursday at 3 p.m. every three months. This would be beginning May 18th. So we're hoping that uh, we will be able to include Rick and Amelia in the near future on one of these meetings. And that's where we left it. We had some good positive steps forward. Thank you. Any questions or discussion around that? Yeah, I have some questions. So first thing is, what is planned for the foundation at the new building? You mean in terms of office space? Yes. Yeah, they have offices. Um, there's two offices for individuals, kind of a open area that'll um, be space for the other two employees to have their desks. There's kind of a common area, a copy center, a little um, kind of a, I don't know what to call it, um, bar kitchen area yeah just a sink and a you know place where they can keep a coffee maker and a microwave a small meeting room and then they have a storage room 
It's about a thousand square feet um, plus the storage room. Okay. So do they have any closed space for meetings? You said there is a meeting. there is a small meeting room, and they'll have access to the other meeting rooms in the building. Okay, so it's like two cubicles and meeting room and an office. Two offices, okay. a, a space for then other two desks that could, that could be cubicles, um, kind of an open area. Uh, reception kind of space where they can have some comfortable furniture and then a meeting, a small meeting room. Okay. So how much staff are we accommodating? The foundation has four employees. Will be that be adequate then? It, I'm just going to have to be. Um, we have 68 employees in this building and all of us are losing space. I would request the you know, chair to have a policy around that, what the expectation of the library towards the foundation is. We don't have any such policy, right? So that would be the guiding principle for any further talks with them that we can refer back to. So you're requesting um, that we discuss policy on office? Space? No, okay. just like a general policy of like we are giving the privilege to the foundation as an exclusive, you know, uh, organization to raise any funds. So we do have expectations from them, right? How the funds are generated, what is contributed back towards the library how the funds are dispersed to the library, how the funds flow directly for some things versus you know what they can hold in their endowment, right? So that policy should be from our side and that dictates how the foundation should be working. It's not the other way around, right? At this point, we don't have anything. And I think having that policy as a reference would be better for, you know, any future contracts too. Are you suggesting like a memorandum of understanding, some sort of general thing like that? That is, that is between the two organizations, but we don't have any guiding principle from our side as to what is expected. Gotcha. Right? So you're asking then that the policy committee discuss a, a policy regarding foundation, kind of a financial outline of what happens with flow of funds, endowment, different things like that. Am, is that correct? Okay. Yes. Um, can we add that to the policy committee line? Thank you. Can you email me if you have any, with any further details or Amelia, so we can get a better idea of sure. kind of what you have in mind? Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion around that? The Fort Vancouver Regional Library District Board of Trustees will now meet in executive session to discuss personnel. Um, the Board of Trustees will be in executive session for 15 minutes. So what time is it? Six twenty. Okay. Okay, we'll meet back here. We'll return at six twenty. The Board of Trustees is not expected to take further action following the executive session. Thank you.
Okay, I'd like to call the regular um, meeting back to order. We're gonna move on to uh, board comments now. Are there any comments from the board? Yes, I'd like to thank Elizabeth for her report and letting us know what's going on here. And we so appreciate your enthusiasm and I'm sure your staff has the same amount. Thank you. I wanted to follow up real quick uh, about some comments I had made at the end of last, um, at the last board meeting and forgive me, my mind is tired and I'm all out of caffeine <laughs> um, from a wonderfully long and productive day. Um, I had mentioned um, uh, the Ukrainian community, Slavic Vo, um, and I wanted to just come back and share real quick some statistics with the board. Um, and again, um, highlight our um, our diversity, equity, um, and inclusion, and 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 understand also we want to be looking all around us about uh, when it when it comes to inclusion and 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 make sure we're not things are not slipping through the cracks. And I just wanted to highlight that the Slavic community is about sixty thousand people in Clark County alone, and Ukrainians my people are about um, 35,000, so majority. Um, and uh, I have not seen any programming return uh, around Ukrainian story time. I don't know if we've ever had that. Um, and um, I would like for us to consider that. Um, um, and I would love to have discussions about the nuances between something in the Russian language and Ukrainian language. Um, and then when I look at materials that are available for bilingual young people, um, families that are uh, like myself, Ukrainian, but English speaking kids, resources like that, I would love for us to, um, you know, scope that out a little bit more um, and talk about access. Um, when I looked at how many materials we have, it's not very much. Um, and when I looked at the details of access to those things, we talked about it before where it's spelled out books, it, it might be in the Ukrainian language, they're spelled out phonetically. It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't translate well to really just about anybody. So I just wanted to um, highlight that, um, consider how we might improve that. It's a great way to serve the community, especially right here in Clark County. And um, it would be just a lovely thing. Thank you. Anyone else? I would like to thank all of the staff that are here that have been here all day long with us. Lee and Tarlap and the ones that have been here from the bitter beginning to the, well, the wonderful beginning to yeah. the wonderful end. So thank you. I also wanted to thank you guys for hosting us today and thank you all the board members too for spending a pretty Saturday here. It's, <laughs> I know it's so pretty outside. Yeah. 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 The next regular meeting will be Monday, April 17th, 2023. It'll be hybrid and at Washougal. I would entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. Any objections? Seeing none, meeting adjourned. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.